No my Heidi my my fellow classmates 89 to 93 at Silverstream. Now we are up to video number 32. So the wee correction from the video before. Um, our, our friend from Upper Hutt, Kieran McCall, was video number 31. And we're now up to video number 32. So really awesome fellas. We're gaining some great momentum. Now the next uh fellow and uh, interviewee is coming to us all the way from the United Kingdom. So, you know, I'm really thankful for him for joining us. It's well, 4 p.m. our time, 5 a.m. his time, and wonderful he's up nice and early. So, listen, for all you guys that are overseas, it can happen. We can do these interviews. We can make it work, guys. So, little shout out to uh, Andrew Cording, Corker, if you're watching. We can interview you, buddy. So, we're looking forward to getting you on board. Now, the next guy, um, your fellow classmate, fond memories of him. Um, had a great sense of humor. Um, he was a day boy as well, and he has done phenomenally well in business. So if you like a beer, a craft beer in particular, then this is the man you're going to wait to hear from. I'll let him tell his story of how it all came about. The brand that he created is called Yeasty Boys. It's a fantastic brand, real craft um, beers and a mix of different flavors, fantastic marketing, really good looking product, and, it, and it, it has done exceedingly well. So we all should be really proud. And if you see a, a cold can or a cold bottle in a fridge of Yeasty Boys, make sure you buy it because you're supporting one of our own one of our own boys, namely the one and only Stu McKinley. Kia ora, Stu. How are you? Kia ora, Eugene. Uh, I'm good, yeah. I've been enjoying the series, as I just said before, off air. Um, yeah, really good to sort of see what's going on. And, you know, sometimes you, um, you you just sort of forget about school, you know, like uh, little times here and there, things come back to you. But uh, And I still keep in touch with, uh, with quite a few people, but to... Uh, see people you know come back on and tell their stories and still wearing their uniform <laughs> that's pretty brilliant um and just to sort of see some names you know that you kind of forgotten in some ways or something and, and uh you know obviously with that facebook messenger group see old photos come up and remember who were in your class i think you know 3pb we were both in that uh i don't think i could remember half a dozen people in that class if i hadn't seen the photo but as soon as i saw the photo you know i remember them all well what their personalities were like you know how tall they were, what sport they played, you know, um, you know, what sort of classes I was in, other classes with them and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting. Well, 100%. And again, thanks for joining us um, so early in the morning. But I must say, uh, for 5 a.m. ish in, in the UK, it looks nice and bright and the birds are chirping away. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, we live in Kent, uh, like 23 minutes to London Bridge, but just outside the M25 and we're like, you know, it's properly the Garden of Eden. Um, you know, it's just, yeah, awesome, awesome wildlife. Um, we get foxes and badgers and stuff in the backyard. Probably about 15, 20 different types of birds. Uh, you'll hear some doves at some point, you know, that sort of like roost nearby. And uh, if we were a bit later in the day, you might hear some kingfishers um, or um, woodpeckers, stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wow. great. Sounds, um, like a, it sounds like a zoo. Yeah, it's like... Um, just before 4 a.m., the birds all start. Um, they get pretty loud. So I usually wake up naturally. This morning I woke up um, about half past four. Uh, usually try and get up about five, have a cup of tea, sort of get stuff in order, maybe like answer a few emails from overseas or something like that. And then at six, the family all start getting up. So it's uh, time to make coffees for Fritha, my wife, and uh, the oldest son likes a coffee and maybe a hot chocolate for the others. And, you know, they have... Uh, have a good breakfast and everything, get their lunch ready and get them away, and then it's back to work. So, um, yeah, sort of uh, six till eight, really, um, it's just a nice time hanging out with the family. Oh, uh, well, wonderful. Well, we're going to get to talking about um, Easter Boys and, and your occupation um, very soon. But, look, initial, first of all, take us back. Take us back to your first years at Stream. Where did you come from? Um, how many years did you end up doing? And can you remember your first day? Um. I came from, uh, I don't remember day that much actually, but a bit of a background, yes, I came from, um, my parents were Scottish, moved to New Zealand, we lived in Porirua until I was about four, and then just before I started school, we moved out to Lower Hutt, and I went to St. Peter and Paul's school, which is like right by Queensgate, although Queensgate didn't exist then, it was just like a big field, felt very different to what it would look like now, um, 
and that was all uh, run by nuns, um, Catholic nuns, and then um, made quite a few good solid friends there that actually went all the way through to stream with me. Um, you know, like very early days, I you know knew Mark Fife, Simon Quirk, um, yeah, a few people like that. Um, Nick Quinn was there, yeah, probably about a dozen or so kids that went through to third form at least, uh, St. Pat's. Then um, uh, moved on to St. Bernard's Intermediate there, uh, and I was this unusual family where my parents actually let us choose, you know, which school we went to, secondary school. So um, just because of the fact of the schools that I had gone through, a lot of the friends that I was uh, sort of had around that time, James Wintrenham was another one. He sort of came late in my primary school. Um, everyone was going to St. Pat's, so I just chose St. Pat's because it was, uh, you know, something that most of my good friends were kind of their parents them up for it and everything. Um, Could have gone to St. Bernard's, which my brother went to. Um, quite a few years before me and then I had a couple of other siblings uh, that went to Hartley High we lived just around the corner from there and um, another sister who went to St Mary's there's five of us and we went to four different secondary schools so none of us had that thing hanging over us of, you know the older sibling who'd been a bit naughty or anything you know the teachers knew oh shit here comes you know that young McKinley <laughs> he's going to be like his brother or something so that was quite nice to go to a school where there was no kind of reputation about, you know, the family or anything like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, as I say, had a few mates, you know, unlike people like Greg Toms, obviously who knew no one when he arrived. I at least had, you know, half a dozen pretty good friends when I arrived on day one. So it wasn't that intimidating as it can be. You know, it's a pretty impressive school, especially, um, you know, when we arrived and there was none of those new buildings and you're walking into, you know, what looks like some Victorian prison or something. Um but I loved it. I loved the atmosphere of that that school and the darkness inside and, you know, just how big all the uh, seventh formers were and everything. And, uh, you know, going down Redwood Building, I think it was, where, you know, it was na the narrow corridor and everyone's like bumping you as you sort of try to get to your end, end uh, classroom. I think I think 3PB, we were down there somewhere, like right down the end. Yep. One of the last classrooms. And you've got to like run the gauntlet to get there. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that kind of stuff. Um, and also the kind of... Uh, I had two uh, older siblings who were hairdressers, so my hair was always really short because, like, either them or all their friends and everything were always like practicing buzz cuts on me. Uh, <laughs> and the thing I remember the most about those first few months was um, people always whispering as I go past, "Fuck, this guy's going to get suspended. That hair is way too short." Yeah, that's <laughs> well, so quite funny to look at. Look at older photos of me and see that I actually grew some hair there because um, all I remember in those first few months is people just being shocked at how short my hair was. It was like, you know, military style uh, buzz cuts. Yeah, gee, got some great memories there. Yeah, and, you, and you're so right. I remember, you know, third form, I just thought the seventh form was were just giants. You know, guys, Jim Gurin and Shane McDonald and you know Christian Fruin and they, they were just massive to us guys I, I just remember thinking far out man you know Bennett Quinn just I just thought they were monsters I know and we were pretty big third formers so you know you think of what it would have been like for you know Dan Walker or something like that it was half our size he would have been you know like running through it kind of like hip height I know you say Dan Walker. I've just I've been talking to Dan lately, and yep, we're going to be hopefully getting him on soon, so we'll be able to hear um, his perspective of things. Now, Stu, what did you do immediately after stream? So your first year out, what did you end up doing? I went to uh, Victoria University, did a um, commerce degree. So um, yeah, probably like a lot of people, you know, straight out of school and into university. Um, which I quite enjoyed, although, you know, in hindsight, probably if I look back, uh, I'd probably recommend to my kids to maybe take a year or two off and think about what they really want to do. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But, you know, I was reasonably good at kind of uh, economics at school, so I just kind of like kicked on into that. Um, and there was a sort of thing in our family, which there probably isn't a lot, where um, no previous generations had gone to university. We were like a real proper working class family, like mostly all coal miners on both sides of my family. Um, back in the day and then um, and then my parents generation they all got trades so they were you know painters um, uh, electricians and plumbers and stuff like that uh, and then our generation you know everyone started to go to university and things like that so my own immediate family my brother who's 13 years older than me he had just finished university I think around the time I started um, but no one else had gone so it was kind of like a bit of a thing um, in the family to sort of you know not not a um, 
formal pressure, but I think, you know, parents were sort of super keen for me to like, you know, use my academic skills a little bit, which I didn't at all, but, uh, you know, at least sort of made a show of doing it. Wow, that's awesome, mate. Well done. And well done for obtaining that um, that degree. Must have been a proud time. Now, look, let's kick into occupation and what you do now, in particular, Yeasty Boys. Look, Yeasty Boys has blown up. It's gone mad, it's gone crazy, it's very successful and a good looking brand, I must say as well. Give us the story, Stu, how did you get into it? Were you sipping on a beer one day and had this idea? How did it all, how did it all happen? My dad, when I was, um, when I was at Stream, my dad was, um, he was always into beer because uh, he'd come from Edinburgh. When he left Edinburgh, it was probably like one of the great brewing cities in the world. And, by the sort of 80s or 90s, it had been decimated completely. There was only one or two left. But when my dad left, there was like, you know, every little village uh, had one all around Edinburgh. There were probably like a dozen breweries in the city itself. Um, and so like everywhere he went, there was always different beer to try. And he was kind of interested in it all. So when he came down to New Zealand, there's obviously not much going on. Um, but, you know, by the early 90s, that little bit of a microbrewing scene started up and down in Lower Hutt, we had like two or three different places. There was a place called Strongcroft in Petoni, and then uh, in Alice Town, there was um, the Parrot and Jigger. They had a brewery there with a few good, you know, beers. And so my dad would often take me out, um, you know, for dinner or something. My mum and dad, and maybe my sister, who was the the other youngest one in the family, would go out for dinner, and we'd go to like the Parrot and Jigger. He'd, you know, give me a taste of his pint or something, or sort of as I got a bit older, it would be, you know, buy a pint for me, and. Um, just kind of got into it a bit through that and uh, he would do a bit of home brewing as well so I did a little bit with him so I got to know kind of the process at least of how it was made and then I sort of like went away from it and came back to it you know a few times over the years so through my 20s uh, I was working mostly when I came out of university I spent most of my time working for the Ministry of Health um, and worked with a couple of um, you know old boys there as well um, and uh, interestingly I worked spent most of my time there working for the um, communicable disease team. So uh, in the you know area that would be looking after the pandemic now, the pandemic response. So I worked for Ashley Bloomfield for a while. Um, he was my boss's boss uh, for a little while. And um, I loved, absolutely loved that job. But there was always something in me that um, my job there was very creative, but was very creative around, um, you know, data and data analysis and stuff like that. Nothing that anyone's interested in. Like when you bring up metadata in a dinner party conversation, conversation goes quiet and we move pretty quickly to you know how the weather is or you know how the black caps are going or something like that so I kind of always wanted a, some sort of a little bit more creative job that you know people could see my work a little bit more and um, I did think really seriously for a while about becoming a chef um, and I sort of looked into ways of going about it and everything and then I started thinking shit I don't want to be working really hard while everyone else is having a good time no I want a, I want a creative job where I can still have a good time with everyone and started thinking about other things and to do with food and everything. And then um, one day I just, just, you know, struck me out of the blue, maybe brewing, you know, that's the one. There was kind of like not much going on in New Zealand at that stage for it. It was almost like we were in a lull between, um, you know, that little boom in the nineties um, and, you know, where we are now. So this is probably like the early two thousands by this stage. So I'm in the mid twenties. Um, and I think I was living up in the Coromandel at that stage, a uh, little town south of, um, Thames, uh, the locals called Puri, but it's Puri, uh, and um, I started home brewing again then, and then that was the sort of point where I started to think, you know, I wouldn't mind learning a bit more about this and sort of trying to make something of it. And by that stage, there was a couple of breweries around that were quite good. There was Emerson's, um, there's one in Nelson called Founders. Um, there were like two or three just sort of bubbling away, and I thought, you know, this could become something. There could be an opportunity here. Uh, and so I started to learn it a little bit, you know, get to know a few brewers, started helping out with um, running the New Zealand Beer Awards, which sort of like, you know, very quickly took off into, um, you know, becoming the sort of uh, head, head scorer and then the head steward. And then I got like uh, dragged into being on the executive committee for the New Zealand Brewers Guild, even though I didn't have any professional interest in, you know, the industry at all, just because I was kind of like, you know, quickly sucked into this very, very small inner sanctum of people who were kind of, you know, running the beer world at that stage. Um, and that's sort of over three or four years of doing that sort of stuff was where I noticed the level of my beer getting to the point where it was good enough to be entered into these, you know, awards and uh, and actually win, you know, win some medals and things like that. Uh, and that was the moment where I just sort of, you know, 
the, the penny dropped and I thought, let's do it. Um, so I kicked it off and instead of sort of raising, you know, a million dollars, like a lot of people would or anything, just started brewing out of my mate's brewery. Um, he had a bit of extra capacity and started to, uh, to make some beer through his brewery and then just sell it where I can, you know, out of the back of the van, basically. Wow. What an amazing, um, startup story there, Stu. Now look, moving on to, uh, 2021, um, can you, and, and please don't be shy, I, I really want you to tell it how it is because we're very proud of, of what you've achieved. Where are you at now? Just how big is Yeasty Boys today? Oh, we're still tiny, mate. We, we, some of the big craft breweries make as much in a morning as we make in a year. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a vast difference between um, the sizes of some of these breweries, like the big American ones, Sierra Nevada and things like that. Um, but we're yeah we're we're doing okay. We're um we've weathered the pandemic, uh, which I think a lot of people probably won't. Um, you know it's been really tough here in the UK, and that this is the you know headquarter and the main sort of sort of thrust of the business now is over here. Um, we kept all our staff on, which we're pretty proud about, um, and we're sort of you know like ready ready to sort of take on the world. So I got a train just about to go past one of the first trains out in the morning. Um, wow. So you might not hear me very well for a second. It's all right. Yeah, I grew up next to Woburn train station, so it's kind of it's music to my ears hearing that. So is that train behind you, is that making its way to central London? Uh, it's, it is, but it's, this is a slow one. That's a commuter one that goes through all of the kind of like little villages in Kent and then in through southeast London, whereas there's one that goes just slightly in the other direction, uh, which would be over my other shoulder, and that goes straight in. So that's a quick one. That's like 23 oh. minutes to London. So there'd be hardly anyone on this one. Um, it just starts to fill up as it, you know, goes into southeast London, into like Nunhead and Beckenham and um, Bromley and that kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, yeah, sorry, carry on. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah, we're we're in a pretty good space at the moment. We've just actually um, we're very close to signing a deal with a you know reasonably big investor in the industry, which is really good. Um, we've signed like heads of terms and we've passed it all through our shareholding and everything. Uh, and that'll mean we actually switch, we officially switch the company to being a UK company, um, which just makes it a lot easier for us to do a lot of things on this side of the world. Wow. Um, we had struggled a little with some of that stuff. Um, so then New Zealand will be a you know subsidiary then. Um, and we'll just continue ticking things on in New Ze- along in New Zealand. We brew in Australia as well. So New Zealand, Australia and over here. But the UK, without a doubt, is, you know, it's the cornerstone of the business now. And it's obviously, you know, within four hours flight of us, we've got, you know, 600 million people or something, it makes sense to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, give us some of the countries where we would find Yeasty Boys in. Cool. New Zealand, Australia, and the UK, obviously, brewing here. Um, we send a bit into Southeast Asia, so like Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong. Um, we have sent a bit into Japan, but it's quite sporadic. Um and then through um, Scandinavian countries, especially um, Norway, sent regularly into there. Um, Italy sent quite a lot of beer into Italy. It was one of our biggest markets until the pandemic. So we haven't seen anything for a year. Um, but I expect that to start to come back on board um, probably late this summer. And then um, France. France is probably our biggest market now um, outside the UK. Netherlands, um, Belgium. Yeah, sort of, uh, we haven't really sort of taken on Europe too much at this stage. We've been concentrating on the UK. Um, but overall, yeah, sort of about a dozen dozen countries. Well, that's amazing because, you know, half of those countries you mentioned are traditional beer brewers themselves. So for you to be yeah. sending your beer in here, that's something, right? That's amazing. Totally. Yeah. In some respects, the traditional brewing countries are um, kind of the easiest ones to get into because they've got, you know, they've got a little bit of a market. You know, they, they know their beer and stuff like that. And um, they're also... A lot of them are slow on the uptake of having their own sort of craft brewery start. So everyone drinks the traditional beer, which is usually much, much cheaper. Um, and so it's not as appealing for people to start up the small, small breweries there. Yeah. Um, so they want to take in the imports. But what we noticed with all countries really is that you tend to send in a fair bit for the first couple of years. And unless you take it super seriously and invest in the market, um, you basically get a you know really good couple of years and then you start to see a slow decline as other you know local breweries start up and their price is better they've got people in the market all the time and things like that so a little bit of novelty wears off and that's the whole reason we moved to the UK to brew here because we'd been asked for many years to send the beer here mm-hmm. uh, and we'd always looked at it and thought it's going to be it's going to be kind of like a one-off you know novelty product if we send it from New Zealand 
it's just going to be too expensive to be sitting in the market generally. Um, so we decided to yeah come over and brew and um, and and actually put it in the market and compete with the, the locals here. How many variants or, or skews of, of beer do you have, and what's the highest strength uh, alcohol beer that, that you have? Yeah, yeah, that's funny because like all the English ask what the lowest strength is because they all think craft beer is too strong. Um, <laughs> We've got um, we got like five beers that we do all year round, um, and then um, and and we got like two of them that are you know much the biggest sellers, and then we've got um, a couple of beers that we do once a year, and then we do a beer about every month as well as kind of like a one off. Uh, right at the moment, our strongest beer is um, nine point two percent, so wow. it's um, it's pretty heady. Yeah, yeah. Good, good good beer for the bus stop or the train. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the lowest ones are like 4.4 percent occasionally we'll do like a one-off that's lower but you know in general that's kind of like the core range that around all year round are sort of 4.4 to 6.5 nice nice and um where do you source all your hops from do you obviously being in the uk is it all local stuff no no we're um we don't use any uk hops at all we use oh, mostly yeah. new zealand wow. um, so the majority is we bring our over our own hops so there are places here you can buy New Zealand hops, but we buy them direct from the, um, the New Zealand hops, um, ship them over ourselves and then, you know, use them over the year. We use a little bit of American and German stuff as well. Um, just to replace stuff that in New Zealand, we would use, um, you know, New Zealand hops for these, but we use ones that are similar from New Zealand or Germany, sorry, US or Germany, because the New Zealand hops are really expensive, you know, once you get them here. So we're looking at like at least twice the price for, um, you know, the New Zealand varieties, even the ones that are not that sort of prominent in our beers, um, as opposed to, you know, buying the US or German ones. Wow, lots of the New Zealand hops. Interesting. Yeah, lots of the New Zealand, yeah, and lots of the New Zealand hops came from sort of German parentage as well. So you can get some sort of pretty similar flavours in some of the modern sort of German style hops as well. Stu, how good? The black caps. How, how did Amazing. you? You're you're over there. How was it? I mean, it was it was early in the morning here when um, when we won it. But man, how good was that? That was awesome. Yeah, I was sitting right right where I am now, and we were doing parent teacher interviews. So um, they were all online, and you know, we're, for our middle son, we're getting like a call every sort of half hour or something. A teacher would call us, and we talk for ten minutes. I'd have to turn the cricket down, and I'd be thinking, should I hope nothing happens while we're on the call? Uh, and my wife. <laughs> Fritha. Fritha does all the artwork for the business. Um, so we work together all the time. We're sitting there, we're drinking martinis and uh, listening to the cricket and, you know, having the occasional parent-teacher interview. It was, like, perfect. Oh, man. Hey, and full kudos to uh, Fritha because I reckon your um, your designs on your can and, and that are just really funky. Cool colours, uh, really, really cool designs. Cheers. Yeah, yeah. No, she's, she loves the car. Definitely likes to work in the background. Um, she's a real introvert, um, but she's um, she loves getting like good feedback, uh, without a doubt. And she loves seeing her, you know, artwork out there and everything, especially like the one-off releases where she really gets to play around a lot more. Yeah. Hey, what are the chances yeah, that, we might we might have to think of a um a special uh, silver stream um edition just quietly? Yeah, yeah. Well, we can always like uh maybe whip up a little. It's, something going there i'm sure i can see the baby that's, blue that's the beauty of the, the baby blue can silver you know i'll leave the rest of fritter maybe a little bit of a sectari feed them emblem in there it'll be sensational yeah maybe maybe you open the can and it sings sectari feed them to you <laughs> oh good stuff all right listen coming to the end memories of silver stream for you is there anything that's really stuck with you all these years you know Anything in particular that you'd like to share with the rest of the boys? I reckon um, oh, there's a few things, I think. I especially remember that first year, that third form year. You know, the school just was awesome to me. You know, like the, the grand scale of it at all and uh, just all the old buildings. And I remember the, like science labs with, you know, all sorts of weird stuff and those shelves, those big old shelves on the walls. And um, I had, um, you know, I like vividly remember David Longy. Um, quitting I think I was in art class um, and like I think I was outside doing something and I came back in and someone kind of said David Longy's quit and that was kind of like a big moment um, 
you know, made a few really good friends there. Um, you know, we had like quite a good sort of crew from the hut that sort of was pretty tight. Some of them were like old friends from, uh, you know, um, primary school and intermediate, but then uh, made a bunch of other friends as well. You know, had a few people. It's funny you mentioned actually before, you know, the first day of school. On the first day of school, I sat next to like Todd Nicholson and um, one of the classes, maybe science or something like that. And I thought, this guy's a fucking cock. He's got his bag had... Uh, his bag had, you know, um, uh, all skaters must die or something like that. And I was a skater. And um, I was like, what an asshole this guy is. Uh, second day, we kind of became mates and uh, still really, really good friends. Day barbecue, just like last week. And uh, we've worked together a lot here in the UK. He works in the beer industry now as well. And um, yeah, sort of, uh, yeah, he's been living over here for about 20 years. But yeah, I see him quite a bit. Obviously not so much in the last year. But yeah, made a lot of other really good lifelong friends as well. Joe McNamee is another one. Um, just, um, yeah, just like uh, making some friends that stuck for life. Yeah, feeling that sort of intimidation, but awesomeness of the school in some ways as well. Had a few good teachers, had a lot of good laughs. Mm. Became pretty good at bunking off school without anyone knowing. You know, when I, I got really into golf, like Andrew Peoples, and uh, a lot of times I remember like, uh, crossing that road at lunchtime or something to go to the golf course in the afternoon, you know, take the last couple of periods off. And I would see like people roaming the train station, like they were looking for people trying to sneak out. Sometimes I'd just walk down the tracks to Manor Park and jump on the train there and, uh, you know, train all the way down to train all the way down to Tony or something and then walk along to uh, Shannon golf course and play a bit of golf. Um, but yeah, just had a lot of good times. And I think I was pretty lucky that academically, I did okay without working very hard. Um, you know, if I'd worked hard, I probably could have done really well, but I just cruised through really. Um, and I enjoyed the friendships I made and the social side of school kind of mostly kept my head down. Didn't get into too much trouble when I did try to get caned, but no one would ever cane me. They'd always give me <laughs> detention. Oh, you bastards. Man. I want to, I just want to yeah. get caned and get it over. And done with. But no, it was, it was pretty good. I was pretty lucky, really. I didn't clash too much with teachers, few that I really liked and, you know, got on well with. And um, overall felt, you know, like I had a pretty good time at school. You know, I felt pretty lucky compared to, you know, watching our kids go through it now. It can be quite tough. It's pretty rough here. And um, in England, you know, some schools are, are pretty full on. Roadmen, our boys call the uh, all the tough kids at school and stuff, you know. Wow. They're always trying to avoid fights with the roadmen. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Todd Nicholson, remember him well. Now we spoke offline and you keep in touch with uh, another good fellow, uh, Andy, Andy Peoples, and, and I hope to catch up with him one day, but he's doing very well in golf, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's loving it. He moved to the UK and he just like, he lived that proper sort of UK small village sort of life. You know, he lived in small towns. He's lived in um, uh, sort of Cambridgeshire, uh, up in Scotland. He lived in Fife. So he played a lot at St. Andrews. Um, and then he's um, living over in Northern Ireland now. Um, so he's been doing a lot of coaching, playing in a few tournaments. I think he was doing quite well on like the Irish um, sort of order of a little internal pro tour before um, the pandemic hit. Um, did really well as an amateur as well. I think he won a couple of like, quite big amateur tournaments here when he was here in his 20s. Um, and again, one of those people that, you know, like you don't see for years and then you just like sit down and it's like you've uh, been catching up every week for the last 25 years. Yeah, I think that's something unique that we have. Now, listen, we're coming to the end. Um, now we're very fortunate, and I don't know if it was anything in the water at Silver Stream, but we've got quite a few fellows uh, in our year, uh, years above and below, that are all in hospitality or beer or both. You know, um, names like Jose Ubiaga and Matt McLaughlin come to mind um, with their various hospitality and bars. Jamie and Will, of course, and, and all that they're doing in the hospo industry and with Fortune Favors, James Henderson, um, with Hop Garden. You know, we're, we're very lucky. And, then, and, and of course, yourself. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful um, collection of guys that are doing well on that whole that whole industry. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We're all piss heads, I guess. Eh? So <laughs> yeah. it made sense made sense that someone was going to end up in that space yeah oh that's dead right all right listen um have you got a message to the rest of the boys that'll be watching this video i know they're going to really enjoy hearing from you so a little shout out from yourself there yeah drop us a line if you're in the uk anyone obviously you can't get here at the moment but um you know anyone who is um catch up for a beer sometime and uh sectare feed them i guess 
Well, there you go, uh, guys. Uh, a little bit of a longer interview today, but I think it's worth it because Stu's come in all the way from the UK. Stu, we wish you and your family, Friffa, and, and your children all the very best. We'll keep in touch from here on in and um, encourage the rest of the boys to keep in touch with you too. And boys, don't forget, if you see Yeasty Boys out there, buy it. It's a good drop anyway, but know that you're supporting one of our fellow brothers. Stu, from all of us, take care, my friend, and thanks heaps for joining us today. My pleasure, mate. Good talking to you and enjoying all the interviews. Um, hope to see heaps more come on. It's like, it's been great. Uh, I'll, um, you know, I'm sure I'll get through a few more, probably a few today now. Maybe watch one right now after uh, after we finish and I have my second cup of tea before uh, before I start waking the kids up. Well, it's uh, Fish and Chip Friday here in New Zealand, so we'll be cracking those open soon. And it's good morning to you in London. See you, Stu. Cheers, huge. See you later.